Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming along to this evening's event. And a big warm welcome to Gillingham Library if you haven't been here before. And welcome to our special Kathleen Courtney event, which is Circle of Six, um, which is a series of programme and events that we're running in celebration of some six wonderful women in the Medway towns and it's great you can join us to celebrate on National Women's Day as well um, it's really great you can come along and um, so we've got room for a real treat tonight we've got some fantastic speakers and um, we've got Sarah Jenkins, Sam Rapp, we've also got Jennifer Godfrey, who will be talking about the life and works of Kathleen Courtney as well. And we've also got Natalie Porton, who's also going to talk to us about Suffrage Century Garden as well. So I'll pass you over to Sam and Sarah, who are going to talk about the project. So thank you, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Good evening everyone. Well, my name is Sarah Jenkin and I'm a community librarian and I'm the project lead for Circle of Six Gillingham. Um, I'd like to thank Kate for taking over this event while I've been recovering from Covid. Uh, it's been a long old journey but I'm back so it's lovely, it's doubly pleasurable to see you all here. I'm delighted to say that Medway Libraries have been successful in our bid for Arts, Arts Council funding for the project and for the next year we shall celebrate the lives and work of six extraordinary women with a close and personal connection to Gillingham. When you leave this talk, remember that you will be walking in their footsteps as you walk into the night. Um, I have lived in Gillingham for a long time and I've worked for it and I thought I knew everything about the history of it. And I found out about these women quite by accident. I was quite annoyed about that, but delighted also. I was investigating the birth date of the poet John Wilmot and I looked up his details on the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. This is an online resource that you can get through your library membership. It's ever so good. And the staff pointed out to me, they said, well, you can do a search for people by area. So, of course, I dug in and I was very excited to find out about people in Rochester. And we're going to hear about one fantastic woman. Um, I was quite astonished and astounded. Why haven't I heard about these women before? So rightly, we celebrate the impact of people connected to better known areas like Chatham and Rochester. But it seems to me like Gillingham, the people who work and live and create work in Gillingham, could be overlooked. And these are places that we generally tend to walk past every day. And I was chatting about Sam Rapp about this and complaining about it and saying, well, why doesn't anything ever happen? And she said, well, why don't you do something about it? So here we are. <laughs> so we have six women, six very different women. And I just want to briefly mention what's different about them. So we've got the poet, Rosemary Tonks. Now, you may not have heard of her now, but back in her day, she was extraordinarily famous and influential. And she was born at the Larkfield Maternity Home in Junction Road. And at the height of her fame, she disappeared like that. And would you like to know why? Well, we're going to have a talk about her in May when you can find out some more. <laughs> well, I mean, her, her works are so influential. I do believe that her first novel is going to be re-released. It's called The Floater. And it's based on the time when she um, created something called a sono montage with Delia Derbyshire. Who, 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 who here likes Doctor Who? She was the woman who originally mixed the first Doctor Who theme tune. Now, Eileen Garwood, or Terza Garwood, she was a, an artist and a wood engraver, and she was born around the corner from Gillingham train station in Kingswood Villas. Dr Lorna Wynne, she was a pioneering psychiatrist, and she was born in the Royal Naval Maternity Hospital um, nursing home in Gillingham and she attended the Chatham Grammar School. Now, she campaigned for the educational rights of children with autism, and she is best remembered for describing autism as a spectrum and for formulating the term Asperger's Syndrome. So, as you can imagine, a hugely influential woman. Now, Sarah Forbes Benita, her journey takes her from West Africa, Madeira, via Gillingham. She, lived, she was the protégé of Queen Victoria, 
she was quite, quite an important woman when it comes to the history of race relations in the United Kingdom. She was a bright woman and she loved music. And she lived in the Palm Cottage, Canterbury Street, which is just around the corner. It's, it's astonishing how, quick, how close these landmarks are. And um, we, we had a talk about her life for Black History Month. Um, in October last year, and I'm hoping we're about to do it again so we can record it so that people would be able to watch it. Um, this woman really surprised me. Her name is Verena Holmes. She was an, art, an engineer and an inventor. And in 1946, she and her friend Sheila Leather formed a company um, in Beresford Road, I believe, to make phantom metal shearing machines and other machines that Verena Holmes had invented in Gillingham. And I had never heard of her, just around the corner from where my dad went to school. So, and as part of this, for our summer reading challenge, we are going to have a series of workshops to uh, create an interest in science and technology, because that's the theme for a uh, um, summer reading challenge this year, isn't it? Yes, it is. So it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's meant to be. So we're going to have some workshops for adults and children, so we can all join in, really. So and we're going to have to talk about her life. And finally, we've got Dame Kathleen Courtney, who we're going to have a talk about tonight. She was a suffragist and a peace campaigner, <coughs> and she was born in York Terrace in Gillingham. And her work throughout the years, I mean, I don't want to talk about it too much, but she had such an impact that in 1972, she was awarded the UN Peace Medal. And if, if we, <laughs> there's always a good need for peace, isn't there? But now, more than ever, I would say. So these are quite extraordinary women, a broad range of personalities, abilities, and impact. But the one thing that <coughs> unites them all, and the one thing that unites many of us in this room, is their sex. They were all women. And during their lives, they were discriminated against on the basis of their sex. Despite these challenges, these women not only survived, they thrived and they made a unique and valuable contribution to the world, the impact of which we still feel today. I found myself wondering, how would my life be different if I had known about these women when I was younger? But we know about them now, and we're gonna learn more about them now. I would like for us all to be inspired by their work, by their ability to triumph during dark days. By working together with their friends and comrades, they were able to create a lasting and positive impact. And I think that's something that can inspire us today. Because you also have all survived some dark days recently. We all have, haven't we? And I believe that our community can also be encouraged by your stories of courage and resilience. And on this note, I'd like to invite you to become part of our project. Because we're not just going to be talking about these women. We're going to be doing a creative project that you can join in. So. Before I move on, I'd like to thank my colleagues who will be hosting the talks and the workshops that will enable <coughs> as many of us to join in as possible, including UK. The Circle of Six um, Women Gillingham is a community project driven by the needs and abilities of our community. And we will be working with as many community partners to encourage as many people as possible to join in. So this will include partners like the Sunlight Trust, the Kent Autistic Trust, the Medway African Community Association, Dyslexia Association, and Fun With Words. As part of our project, we are encouraging everyone to write down their own responses to the women and their work. And we will create a book at the end of this project. So Sam will be taking the lead on this, on the creation and editing of this book. And she will speak a few words about it now and how you can get involved. Everyone is invited. It doesn't matter if you've written before or created art before, or if you haven't done anything since school you can make your mark. Even if you just want to tell us your story, that's still gonna be enough. You can inspire someone, and you will inspire the people who follow after you and walk in your shoes. So Sam, come and, come and let us know. Amazing speech, well done Sarah, and it's a delight to be here. International Women's Day, hooray. Um, break the bias is the theme for this year. So we are breaking the bias, and they broke the bias when they campaigned 
and t Dame Kathleen Courtney campaigned with all her comrades um, to get the vote for women. And what was quite interesting is that it wasn't until 20, um, 2015 when um, Saudi Arabia actually gave limited rights for women to have the vote. So we still got a long way to go as, as well in terms of the whole world, making uh, access, accessibility and inclusion for all. So um, thank you to the library, thank you to Kate and Sarah and to everybody on the door, to Barry and Natalie and, uh, and Piers and everybody who is here. Um, we're going to do a book. Uh, we haven't decided on the, sub the title yet, but it's going to be um, writing workshops and poetry and short stories or even pictures. Whatever, whatever how you want to contribute, we want you to contribute to this book. It is all part of celebrating our local history, which is brilliant, by the way, a brilliant local history in terms of women and what achievements they have done. So we will be asking for contributions. We will be sending a call out and we'll be uh, uh, advertising that in May for the launch of Rosemary Tongs, which Sarah has highlighted. Um, as we go through the year, we'll be looking at all the other women, having workshops and having talks and speeches um, in relation to that. And it's all going to go in this book. So without further ado, um, I will be quiet because I can probably talk for the whole night. Um, and um, we will hopefully shortly be uh, seeing Jenny who will come and um, talk to you about her book all about the local history and the suffragette movement um, in Gillingham, which is fantastic. Who, who here has seen the film Suffragette before I be quiet? It was on last night or the other night, wasn't it? And it's an amazing film of all the hardship, of all the fact that the hunger strikes, the protests, and Emily running in front of that horse and highlighting the vote for women. Obviously, it was a slow process, wasn't it? Because you had to be 30 um, and then you could vote and then eventually it went through, through time and then we had the Equality Act um, and um, all the rest of it that followed. But we've still got a long way to go, haven't we? Let's, let's face it. Um, so, um, so that's why we're so passionate about this project and that we just want to highlight these women and focus on these women in particular. So anyway, I'll pass you over to Kate. So thank you very much for coming and uh, let's listen to Jenny when she gets here. Thank you. So um, while my, 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 my glamorous colleague Kate is doing all the technical stuff, um, I'd just like to introduce Natalie. Natalie is, um, I don't know how to describe the project lead, the, the guru, the, the, the mastermind, the maestro behind the Suffrage Century Garden. And I was delighted to hear about the existence of this. This is, um, she describes it as utilising an existing raised garden space on Rochester Esplanade. She will create, or we will create, because it's very much a community spirit, an accessible sensory area for visitors of all ages and abilities as a tribute to local suffragist Vera Conway Gordon. Now, if you would like to read um, Jennifer Godfrey's book, we've got a copy of it here somewhere. It does mention um, Vera and her work. She was the president and honorary secretary of the Rochester branch of the non-militant National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. I will not say that again. Um, so this sensory garden will be dedicated as a permanent tribute to her work and it will be the first dementia and autism friendly green space in the local area, which really connects well with the work of Dr. Lorna Wing. So, you know, it's, uh, we're all connected. Okay, so I moved to Rochester about 16 years ago and oh, this is lovely, it's a really nice place and it's just Dickens. And you know, Dickens is all well and good, but there must be more to it. And about four years ago, about five years ago, we were leading up to the um, representation of the people at Centene. And with a friend, we thought, well, <coughs> did anything happen around Rochester? So we popped into the library, uh, not the library, the, the, the Guildhall Museum, and said, is there anything there? And we said, no, nothing happened around here. I said, I made stone. So we ran up made stone and said, yes, there was lots in Rochester. Go off to Medway Archives and have a look in the um, in the archives and see what there is to be found. So we went there and found out all sorts of things happened. The 
Pankhurst spoke here in Rochester and in Gillingham and in Chatham, and it was a really big um, organisation because they were both the suffragists and the suffragettes. And generally in Rochester, um, women tended to join both organisations, but then as time went on, because it was a sort of liberal stronghold and a lot of the women were married to kind of quite um, well-to-do gentlemen in the town, they tended to veer towards the more peaceful side of the campaign. So, once we started looking into Vera Conway Gordon, her story was just incredible. And there's lots to read up on the um, boards over there later on. And I'm here to talk about the garden, not about her. But we thought, this is something that needs to be recognised. This woman's work, she gave a whole lifetime to campaigning for women and for children, and later for animals as well. She was one of the founder members of the United Nations in uh, Whitstable, where she moved to later on. And then when she died, uh, a few weeks short of her 81st birthday, on her death certificate, despite her having written three books, campaigned all of her life, and been a fiercely independent woman, on a death certificate, her occupation is recorded as the spinster daughter of. Mm -hmm. And once we saw that, no, something has to be done. So, Anyway, I'll talk to you about the garden, which I'm here to do. In Rochester, in, um, opposite the castle, there's a raised garden bed in the Esplanade that's been, it's just been left to go wild. It's really a mess. It's really sad. And it turns out that this is exactly opposite where Vera used to live. Strange coincidence there. So if you know the, the Esplanade at all in Rochester, the bridge up the top here, mm -hmm. that's the castle. There's the raised garden, which curiously enough looks like the peace symbol. Nobody <laughs> seems to know <laughs> how it came there, but it was probably put, we think, probably built about 45 years ago. But nobody's been able to enlighten us how or why. Uh, Vera Conway Gordon lived actually in this house here. The place that swimming baths, I think, where the swimming baths used to be. Yes, it was, so it came off the swimming baths. That's why we kind yeah, of figured out where way. it was built, but nobody seems to know why. And it is curious that it's got that shape. So, the background I mentioned the um, campaigning for the women's right to vote, um, but it didn't really take off until after 1910, after the, um, the Black Friday, when uh, the, the first time that suffragettes women were arrested and actually treat, treated very, very badly. Um, the Rochester WSPU, the purple, white and green votes for women suffragettes, was founded in 1911, and the NUWSS, the uh, National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, the, the non-militant um, campaign, was formed in the following year in January. Vera was elected as the President and Secretary of the Rochester branch, and here's a nice picture of her, which is over on the... And then in 1913, she led all sorts of different talks and protest marches, but she led the peaceful um, pilgrimage to London, which started from I think it was 17 different places across the country. And the women, they walked, they rode, they bicycled, they were a couple of caravans. It's really, really interesting. Um, and I think it was 50,000 people turned up at Hyde Park, and there were no arrests, and it went off peacefully. But everybody forgot about it years later. So this is Vera. Now, the garden. As you can see, this picture was taken at the beginning. There is an existing garden with these raised um, brick outlines, which is the perfect size for somebody with limited mobility, in a wheelchair perhaps, they can perhaps just reach in. But initially, there's this very, very high box hedge all the way around, and it's completely overgrown. Medway would come in about once a year with power tools and just cut it off at a height, and that was it. 
It's an amazing site because uh, we've got the castle on one side, we've got this fabulous views all the way around. So there's the bed, and you can see the castle in one direction, the bridge and the river in another, and there's some beautiful trees in the third direction. It's just such a shame that it's been so, so neglected. And that's a nice little aerial shot before we started. <laughs> and as you can see, this light green is a really dense box hedge, which will stop anybody reaching in or actually enjoying anything that was there. And it's just completely wild. It's mostly grass and maybe Anyway, it's been a mess. So, the work required to, to actually turn this into a really nice century garden is to prepare the existing beds, which is bramble and grass and all sorts of dreadful stuff, um, and then replace the existing um, plants. They are, they are plants, to be fair, but they're not really very nice. <laughs> and plant them out with new century plants um, in the colours of the WSPU, the green, white and purple, and the red, white and green, to celebrate both campaigns. Now, the first bed has been cleared, and we've started planting um, a range of sensory plants. And the second bed is work in progress. As you can see, it's uh, a really quite a tough job, but there is something for everybody, whether they, whatever um, their experience or ability. And if you don't, I don't feel much like climbing in there. So I'm quite happy to sort of reach in from the outside. Or I've been working around the, the bottom of the wall where we can't sit there, but it was all grass and overgrown. Uh, and then we've got other people who are much keener to kind of get in there and get stuck in, which is quite good. Um, and the third bed needs clearing. So that's where we are. And um, this, if this works, should be a little movie of. Yes. <laughs> If anyone's available, just turn up, 10 o'clock to 12, everybody's welcome. It's really good fun and we hope to start planting the second bed very, very soon. And that's it. That's all about the garden. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I'm Jenny, or Jennifer, and um, my book is actually called Suffragettes of Kent, although as you'll find from my little talk, um, I ended up uncovering not just suffragettes, but suffragists. So suffragettes tended to be the ones that like to pour tar into post boxes, smash windows, set things alight, 
demonstrate, and suffragists were obviously the ones that were more law-abiding, um, and liked to lobby and did that for many, many years. So, um, yeah, today I was going to talk to you, obviously, about Kathleen Courtney, um, but I wanted also to tell you a little bit about other people that were in the area and how it all kind of fits together. If I can, it'll be a bit of a snapshot, um, because my book, obviously, um, is about the whole of Kent. So I just wanted to start by telling you a little bit about the research um, and writing that I did, um, because it'll make you understand really why I'm even arrived here today to talk about Kathleen. So um, when I first was asked to write this book, they asked me to write a book called Suffragettes of Maidstone. And I've got nothing against Maidstone, um, but I just didn't think there'd be enough material there. So, and I was wrong, I was completely wrong. You could write a book easily about Maidstone um, and what happened there. Um, but at the time I didn't know that. So I um, quizzed that, challenged that if you like, and ended up getting this rather lovely title, Suffragettes of Kent. But obviously that had its own issues, and the main issue for me, being a real detailed person, um, I trained to be a lawyer, so I'm very, very detail conscious, um, is the detail. I just could not let anything drop when I was researching. I just became so um, passionate about everything I found. I just wanted to include it, even if it was a name, to be honest with you. Um, so I'm so, it was so detailed that I actually had 40,000 too many words for my book um, and had to cut the book. So I only had to have 90,000 in total, so I can imagine it's a big task. Um, but that, I've learned a lot through doing that. Um, and the reason, really, that I'm here today, actually, to talk about Kathy a little bit and other people is that. I mentioned her name, that was, that was, her name is in my book as a speaker, and I'll come on to that um, in a bit. No more detail really. And she was like numerous other people that as I uncovered them, I wanted to include just a name or a reference. And that could be a suffragette, a suffragist, someone that helped them along the way, like we've got farmers, um, one story I had was farmers helped them when they came touring. I just included as much as I can. And to be honest, I'm really grateful that I did. I'm really glad I made that decision because it was quite a difficult decision at the time um, because the outcome of that for me has meant that I've started to meet and do other things. So for example, Natalie with the garden in Rochester, I've been along there and did a bit of digging. I don't think I was the best person, <laughs> and, but I, I really enjoyed that. And um, today, funnily enough, I was at another event um, earlier today and met this lady here. She's just in front. Um, she's a stunt double, and she she was in the suffragettes film. So, and and she's actually related in some way to to a suffragette or a suffragist, and she wants to find out more. So that's why I'm really grateful that I did it in that way, and it's meant um, not only have I got to have a really interesting time, but other projects have come about, and particularly around young people. There's been a lot of projects I've been able to help with on that, or at least talk to me about, I won't say help. So, I do want to just go back to 1866 and start there, only because there was actually someone called Gillingham that signed the 1866 petition. So in 1866, it was the first mass um, petition for votes for women. So there'd already been lobbying before that, but in 1866, everyone around the country put their signatories in to Parliament to lobby for votes for women. And um, actually, there were, uh, the people that did it, sorry, were people from London, so this lady here, Barbara Lee smith Bodger, she was from Kensington in London, and there was a society called the Kensington Society. She was a member of that. She came out to Kent um, to get signatories for Kent. So in total, there were 1,500 signatories for that petition, and um, she and one other lady collected nearly 40, uh, nearly 50, sorry, um, from Kent. And one of those was actually a lady um, in Gillingham. Now, I don't know any more about that person at the moment, but it's just interesting that um, way back then they were doing this kind of work. The reason we know their names is because you see a common theme throughout everything, um, all of the um, operations they did, if you like, they were extremely meticulous in their planning, and they wrote them all down. So because when the petition goes in, it's destroyed. They wrote every single name down. So you know all of their names. People have researched their names. There's probably research um, on this lady. In my book, I talk a little bit about her. She was a well-educated lady, I know that much. And um, she was from, from June. 
The other really interesting people that were in this area, other than Kathleen, which we'll come to, um, are these ladies called Laura Ainsworth and Mary Lee. So Mary, um, Laura is over on the right hand side, Mary's in the middle. And they were um, two of the first, there were seven women in 1909 um, who were forcibly fed. And they were the first suffragette prisoners to be forcibly fed um, in Winston Green Prison, Birmingham. And these were two of the first. Um, I will read an account in a minute from um, Laura of the experience of that. But the reason it's interesting here is because Laura was actually paid what they call a paid organiser in this area for the WSPU. So the WSPU was the um, Emmeline Pankhurst led group, so the Women's Social and Political Union. And she actually um, operated in Maystone in North Kent in 1911. And you can see her address there. She lived in Stuart Road, Gillingham, and she was a lodger with the Gundy family. Um, and I'll just read now from here the extract about forceful feeding. That picture on the left gives you a little bit of an impression of what they went through. So she says, owing to an injury received before going into jail through someone hitting me on the nose with a stone, it appeared that the nasal passage was closed. One of the doctors then said, it is no good, we have to use the tube. I was raised into a sitting position and a tube about two feet long was produced. My mouth was prized open with what felt like a steel instrument and I, then I felt them feeling for the proper passage. At this time I was held by four or five wardresses I felt a choking sensation and what I judged to be a cork gag was placed between my teeth to keep my mouth open. It was a horrible feeling altogether. I experienced great sickness, especially when the tube was being withdrawn. Twice a day, morning and evening, I was fed in this way. In the middle of the day, a small quantity of meat extract was forced through the teeth, a wardress meanwhile holding my mouth and nose. It goes on as a big account in there of what she experienced. And she would have come to Kent after this, this is 1909, she was in Kent in 1911, she will no doubt tell people all about that <coughs> and um, spoke of that. The other thing that um, Laura did was she boycotted the 1911 census, she was in Gillingham at the time, and a lot of women did this, and again I've got a chapter on the people from Kent that did this, they did it in different ways. They either spoiled their paper by writing across it, or they didn't, they weren't in the premises when they were uh, being checked, um, or they wrote on there something about votes for women, suffragette. And what Laura did was quite interesting um, and unusual actually. <laughs> um, I don't know anywhere else, particularly in the country, that did this. She got people together and had a party, but she, she had this in um, Jezreel Hall. And there was a man there, uh, and a lot of people don't realise there were men involved in this campaign as well. There were men that were forced to be fed as well as women, because um, until 1918, not all men could vote. So, and they obviously had sympathies for the women too. So um, there weren't many involved. That would make a great book, actually, for a man's, a man's angle. Um, but anyway, so 39 women and one man um, basically had a great big party. And the only reason they know there were that many is they made such a load of noise that the police were called and um, there was a way of checking. They basically sent someone around with a form, so they learned something about the way they'd handled it, but they had a good time as well. Um, so that's Laura and, and Mary Lee. Um, both spoke an awful lot. Uh, Mary Lee, particularly in Chatham, did a lot of talks and they're all, there's accounts of them. You can find those as well. While I was um, researching my book, uh, quite a way into researching, actually, quite near the end, sadly, um, I came across about three lines that mentioned um, Ethel Violet Bulldog from Maidstone arrested suffragette. That's basically all I got. And I decided I would follow that and see where it took me. And I was really pleased that I did because it was a story that hadn't been told before. So Ethel, uh, which was born in 1893, actually in Gravesend, but grew up in Maidstone. But honestly, she lived in so many places because she was a really feisty person. She went into service at 12 and she kept losing her job. She just kept having to move on. She was fortunate that she had a really good aunt that could find her good places. So when she lost one, she'd get another one. But um, when she was arrested in 1912 um, as a suffragette, she, the family were ashamed of her, actually. So 
Um, at that time, she was living in Tunbridge um, The reason I know some of this information is I'm in touch with her family. I managed to find her descendants and her granddaughters, both of whom still live in Kent. Um, sadly, didn't get to meet her son, but did meet, have met her two granddaughters, uh, great granddaughters, great niece, and they've still got the family Bible. And that's how you know their church. She had so many musicians because she sent postcards um, from everywhere she worked. So she worked in some really nice places, um, but she just kept losing her job. So how did she get arrested? Well, she was one of the women, nearly 200 of them, that went to London in 1912 in March, got herself a hammer and some stones and smashed the windows. And um, it was what is known as the Great Protest. It was a proper WSPU, Emily Pankhurst led, kind of a secret mission. And um, she was one of the youngest to be arrested. She was partnered with um, an old hat, old hat at um, Violet Bland. They seemed to partner them up, novice with master, which was quite clever. Um, and she was arrested and carted off with the rest of them. Um, and then they would all went to Holloway initially until they were charged. Um, and then they were spread out across the country, which I'll come on to. Ethel was fortunate in that she only stayed in Holloway for 17 days on the mound, then she was released. Somebody paid £200 for her to come out, and I'm um, not sure who, I don't think it would have been an employer. Probably one of, um, used to get people that were supporting the campaign that didn't want to go to prison for it, but have money to, to splash, if you like. Might have been that, I'm not sure. Not even sure who she went with to London, although where she was living at the time in Tunbridge Wells was a real um, hotbed for suffragettes. There's lots of characters which I can come on to if we have time. Um, but she may have gone with them. Um, so the unusual thing about this protest is that most of the women there thought they'd be in prison for seven days, and actually they were there. She was the shortest 17 days for a The rest of them were three months, four months, six months. Most of them were sent off to other places and they were forcibly fed um, as well. It was one of the first times they went back to, be, to using their tactic for forcible feeding. Um, I've just included this to show you the kind of research and that that I'd go through. So there's a document that the National Archives have that's got every single suffragette ever arrested and they just list them like that. And then if there's, a, if there's more than one date under their name, that's how many times they've been arrested. Um, Ethel's on the bottom here. Ethel Violet Bulldog, she's only been arrested once. And that's how you find these names. And that was a record of her court appearance. There wasn't much on Ethel's. I should have said that's that picture that was the drawing of her of the cell that was next to Ethel. That was actually drawn by another inmate at the time. Um, there were lots of artists and um, actresses and that in there. Um, Ethel didn't have any diaries or any accounts first hand, so only bits just trying to piece it together. Because lots of them did. Lots of them, this wasn't the first time they'd been in there. So just quickly on forcible feeding, that's a nice topic. To round off on them, actually. It's not a nice topic, but um, from that particular protest, there were so many um, women in prison at that time that they um, needed to spread them out, they needed to put them out into different uh, prisons. So some of them came to Maidstone, so that's when I go back to that point about could I have written a book about Maidstone? Yes. Um, so four of them were actually in Maidstone and three of those four were forcibly fed as well. And by this time, the um, Home Office had decided there was a new way of checking whether you, you were fit to be forcibly fed. So before you actually, they actually started with all of this procedure, they would have a doctor assess you and check whether you'd be well enough to be forcibly fed. It was all about protecting them and their liabilities. And then by 1913, the following year, they introduced this other act, which I've written it on the top there, but it's actually nicknamed as Cat and Mouse Act. And the idea was that the CAT, the Home Office Prison Authorities, would release that prisoner once they became too ill to either, if they were not eating, um, or they were being forced to be fed, they would release them on licence, and then they would become a mouse to run off, get better. The cat would go chase them when they got better, bring them back and make them finish their sentence. Um, Obviously, they had to find them first, they were very good at hiding. Um, but that, that was what that act was about. 
and a very famous um, suffragette um, came, which was Annie Kenny. She was actually brought to Maidstone Prison. She tried to blow up a canal in Birmingham um, with a group of other women, and she failed. And they were arrested and brought, they were actually taken to Holloway. But she was identified as a troublemaker along with her friend Rachel, Rachel Vernon, and they were split off from the group. She was brought to Maidstone and Rachel was taken to Canterbury. Neither of them were forcibly fed there, but they both immediately went on hunger strike. So the reason they were released under this act was because they became too ill. They actually left in ambulances, they were so ill. Um, and the interesting thing about Annie was, Annie Kenny was one of the original WSPU. She was one of the women that started it with the Pankhurst in 1903 in Manchester. Um, she, was one of, she had a sister, Jessie, and they were mill girls. And um, the interesting thing about her was she got her license, her Maidstone prison license, and she sold it to raise money for, for the cause. She was all about the cause. She wrote um, quite a few accounts, and in one of them she spoke fondly of Maidstone and said the doctor was actually nicer than the one in the So um, it, it was just fascinating to find that actually um, Maidstone could have been a little on its own because there were so many links. I think it's mainly the prison, but obviously there's lots of speeches there as well. Um, yes, yeah, so that's forcible feeding. Ah, oh, now we're getting on to Kathleen. So, um, in 1913, we had um, a really big pilgrimage. There was one in 1908 as well. We wasn't quite as big as this, and um, I didn't find any reference to Kathleen for that. But in 1913, the NUWSS, that's the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, it's the suffragists, it's the ones that are law abiding, that don't go around smashing things up, they lobby, um, they campaign, they have a tea in the parlour, they, they recruit members in that way, they don't go around with hammers like Ethel did. Um, so they were challenged, uh, or felt challenged, by the government who said they didn't believe that the majority of women wanted to vote. And so they decided to put on this big pilgrimage, which is equivalent nowadays of a, of a marketing campaign, obviously we use social media now, but in those days um, it was all very simple, but meticulously planned. So you can see just about, sorry about the detail there, but you can see the lines coming into London, down at the bottom. They're all routes that, that came into, into London. Um, the idea was to meet in London on the same day, I think July 26th, and they would then have a big demonstration. Um, so they'd obviously set up at different times depending on how far they were away. And the idea was to involve as many people as possible. It was a real inclusive <coughs> pilgrimage. It was about, you didn't have to wear the certain colours, our suffrage colours, you just had to be there. If you wanted to walk the entire route or go the entire route, you could, or you could just do a bit of it. Or if you could only put someone up or give them something to eat along the way, give them a spare horse, give them a rest, however you could help, that was the idea of this pilgrimage. And the idea was to bring out as many people along the way as they could. So in Kent, what was really great is we had two routes. We had um, a northern route and a southern route. We kind of had a third route, which I don't know if you can quite see here. Um, just here is Tunbridge Wells. Mm -hmm. So Tunbridge Wells, as I said at the beginning, they were a real um, hub of um, suffrage activity, main, mainly um, suffragettes, actually there's lots of really feisty suffragettes from there. But it was a real area um, of suffrage campaigning. And they decided to have their own little route tagged on. So they did um, from Tunbridge through um, to Southbrook and then into Tunbridge. Now Tunbridge was the place that all of the pilgrimage pilgrims from Kent met. So on the uh, northern route is the route that, that's most relevant to this area, obviously, um, coming along. Um, but you have the southern route as well. On each route, you had um, what they called an organiser that basically meticulously planned where they were going to go. When I trekked it all back, they had plans of where they would be, and then when they actually did it, which I followed and tracked as well, they missed bits out, or there were no accounts of certain bits, or they changed the route slightly. So things must have happened, like any project, any you, things happen, they don't go to plan completely. Um, but it was so meticulously planned. 
Um, and like I say, the idea is they're all making their way to make sure they're on time to be in London for this big protest. So um, what happens um, there along the way is this is where Kathleen Courtney comes in. Kathleen Courtney was one of the, definitely one of the speakers on the northern route. So as we know, she was born here in Gillingham. Um, she was always involved in the suffragist, definitely suffragist, not a suffragette. Um, so she was in Manchester in 1908 and um, through three years. And she was there, the secretary of the North of England Society. So that was quite a big area, actually, that she was covering and quite a big role. And it was Manchester, which is where, um, arguably, well, Pankhurst would have you, have you believe that's where it all started. But she was up in Manchester. She then came to London, and that's why she was then able to get involved in the Kent side of this pilgrimage. So she then um, was actually the secretary of the whole um, NUWSS. So again, um, a really massive role, really big role. Now, she was just one line in my book because she was one um, of several speakers that um, spoke all the way um, around that northern route, but particularly in the areas I put at the bottom, which are Newington, Raynham, Gillingham and Chatham. But she, um, it says she spoke there, but there were actually no documents when I came to look through to find out what happened, where they stood, what the weather was like. A lot of these accounts that I found actually told you all of that. You know, if there was some woman swinging around a lamppost um, doing something strange, or um, they described one man as being a comedian, i.e. he was heckling them. Um, so there were really detailed accounts, and they were found not only in the newspapers, um, but also in the magazines. I don't think they bought them literally, but all of these um, societies and groups of women had their own uh, magazines that they edited and sold. They sold them for the cause, and it accounted all of their um, journeys, if you like. So Kathleen was heavily involved, um, she would have been a speaker and she spoke more than once. So that showed you that she wasn't just popping out in Gillingham, she was along the route, uh, working probably alongside the organiser. And she would have, I'm sure, met this lady um, during the matters. I think I'll say in the break. There's so many connections with these women um, and I find that fascinating, I find connections fascinating anyway. Um, you know, they either knew each other from somewhere else or they got to know each other doing things like this. But Muriel Matters was an amazing um, speaker. She was um, Australian, she was an actress, and her speeches are really eloquent, they're just amazing. She did an awful lot of things. She was part of the Women's Freedom League as well, which was a branch off of the WSPU. Um, she did things like hire an airship, fly out above Parliament and throw out votes for women bills. Um, she really thought outside the box. Um, and she was very strong and determined and heckled uh, most of the accounts I find and found her speeches. It's just sad that I couldn't find any more detail about her speaking perhaps with Kathleen or Kathleen even speaking, but she was definitely on the route. And it must be because of her connection back here, I'm sure of it, she would have having been born here, grown up here, she would have known it. So um, I think I put the quote up there. This is just to, to explain to you, this was a different pilgrimage to some of the other tours um, that the suffragettes did. Suffragettes were not as welcomed as the suffragists. Um, so I've said here, the reception of the pilgrims has everywhere been satisfactory. Hundreds of members and friends have been enrolled, and many common causes sold. Common causes was the name of their magazine that they used to make, edit, and sell. And you notice the word friends, which goes back to that point I was making. She's come back, obviously, with her connections here. Uh, friends here probably um, got them involved as well. And um, that's what's just so key here how they all work together, really. Um, so we'll come back to Kathleen in a minute, but that's her involved in that northern route. They then go to Rochester, and I know you've had Natalie talk about um, Vera. Um, so this is Vera Conway Gordon, and she um, is leading the procession here, coming through Rochester. 
So um, who knows if caffeine's in there? I mean, that's the sort of thing that you start to wonder, or I do. Um, so this, this group, um, I noticed in some of the accounts, say when they were in Canterbury, there were only 30 women, and then in other places there were sort of 60, 70 women. Um, why that is, I don't know. Maybe just because they got their friends, you know, to come together, people they knew. But this is them coming through Rochester on this particular pilgrimage um, through to go to London. And then they get to London, and uh, Millicent Fawcett, who was the head of the, uh, she was the lead of the NUWSS, she's one of the speakers. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but there were 50,000 spectators at this protest on this day, and there were 19 um, platforms and 90 speakers, and all accounts seemed to show that it was just nigh on impossible to get close to these platforms and for the women speakers to get off. So they spent a lot of time standing there talking. Um, so I would imagine Kathleen's gone to this, it's, it's been there definitely, um, along with Muriel, along with um, the organisers. Um, so they've gone to this and they've made a real noise and um, demonstration and it's gone really well. There's no trouble at this particular um, pilgrimage. And they've then asked, or well, Millicent, um, Millicent has, she's asked for a deputation to see the Prime Minister to find out uh, what do you think. Um, and was granted that, but it wasn't until the August. And um, but he actually said at that deputation that he didn't, hadn't changed his mind, what they'd done hadn't changed his mind. So he wasn't going to support them for their for their right to, um, right to vote. So um, I then included um, this about Dame Kathleen Courtney, we should call her, um, because what I've found as well when I'm doing talks is people like to know what happened to the person, not just what they did. And um, actually that again will make a fascinating book, because like, they love to know where they went, what they did, were they always like it or did they just do what seemed to, you know, Ethel seemed to do, which was just arrive at a protest and then not do anything else. Um, or was there more to them? And obviously, um, Dame Kathleen Courtney, um, there was a lot more to her. She was involved through, right the way through um, to her death in, um, she was involved in the UN as well. She was involved in so much. But um, the interesting thing here is that in 1917, um, she, continue to be um, this active officer. They changed the name to the National Council by this point. And um, even more interesting, in 1919, she's now the Vice President of what is then, what was the NUWSS, it's been renamed um, then to this snappy title, National Union of Societies for Equal Citizenship. So this is 1919, this is after 1918, when some women, um, women who were 30 or older and had certain property or certain money um, could vote. She's still campaigning. She's still campaigning because not everyone has got the vote. Ethel couldn't vote in 1918. Uh, she had to wait till 1928. So, so then Kathleen Courtney never gave up. You know, she's one of those women, and uh, many of them, but she was one of those. And um, she continued to campaign for equality, um, equal citizenship. Um, she also did, like um, quite a few um, women that campaigned, she worked for um, other aspects around, like poor law reform, they called it. And one of the things she did is work with Eleanor Rathbone, who was an MP, and she worked to get family allowances, which were um, introduced actually, I think it was 1945, something like that. So she was heavily involved in that. The bit I absolutely love, and I would love to find and see if there's any more detail about her for this, um, is that 50 years after some women got the vote, we, we've just celebrated obviously the 100 years, but 50 years after, when she, she was a speaker as part of the campaigning for getting that vote, getting that law changed in 1918, she's speaking again. I just love that, I just love the fact she's back and she's in Westminster, and she's speaking about um, celebrating that 50 years. I just think there must be something somewhere about, about that speech. 
and about background to it, because it would have been a project like this is a project, it would have been a project in its own right. So I find that really fascinating. But by all accounts, an amazing, awesome lady um, who, until her dying day, worked and campaigned for others, basically, to improve, to improve life for others. So um, this, this, uh, this didn't affect this area. That's why I've added them at the end, because I thought they'd be less of interest to you for this particular area. But um, the WFL, I mentioned them, they're the Women's Freedom League. They actually are branched off of the WSPU, the Emmeline Pankhurst, um, if you like, led group, because they just, there was a disagreement about how it was run. The lady in the window, can you see it? She's an older lady in the left sitting down. That's um, Charlotte Despard, but she likes to be called Mrs. Despard. And she was one of the founder members of the WFL. Um, now, in 1908 and 1913, she came to um, Kent campaigning for um, votes for women and also to try and get membership. And she was trying, she, especially in 1908, she just set up the WFL, she needed members. So, what she decided to do when she looked at Kent, she realised it was quite a rural area. She couldn't get, they couldn't get there by train, some of the areas, so they got a little van, so they got this van with a horse called Asquith. And basically they toured around, they, they started in Southborough, near Tunbridge Wells, and they toured around Cranbrook, all the way around there, down to the coast, and then they sort of scooped back, they didn't come here, they went to Maidstone, then down to Seven Oaks and back out. But the amazing thing about this is they did recruit but actually they recruited full-on suffragettes in the end. The two women standing down in front of the van, they're called the Tillard Sisters, and they're from South Bramir Tungeville. They ran on to greet this van, and they carried on and did some of the tour as well. Um, they're not, they were young, they're not been involved before, but they ended up doing some really um, big protests. So. Um, Violet Tillard actually became lifelong friends with Muriel Matters, the lady I've mentioned before that probably knew Kathleen, it's about connections again. And um, they were actually two of the women that went into Parliament. They managed to get into Parliament when it was in session, and they lowered down a flyer into Parliament <laughs> behind the ladies' girls. <laughs> and they got out, they escaped. And there's a lady called Helen Fox with them as well. They, they had help, they had males and then help them to get in, that's how they got in. But they managed to get out, and they would have been fine, but obviously they joined the protest that was going on out the front, mm -hmm. and they were arrested. And then her sister Irene, she became friends with Charlotte, or Mrs Despard, and they were actually arrested the following year for knocking on MPs' doors, and making a nuisance of themselves. So, um, yeah, they did all sorts of things. The lady in the window is the same lady up the top, that's Alison Nealands, she's a really clever lady, and she became their like finance director, she was really, really clever. And the rather <coughs> scary-eyed looking lady, Marguerite, she and Alison basically were two of the van organisers. They had van organisers, a bit like the um, tour organisers, where they would look after the van, they would look like logistic managers, check if everyone's all right, check they had food, get a new horse when they needed it, find somewhere safe to stay, because unlike on the pilgrimage, these women were not welcome, so they were attacked. And in fact, when they made it to Maidstone, they were attacked so badly, and that's why they ended up finishing just in Seven Oaks, is their van was smashed up, and Mrs Despard was actually very badly hurt, she had something thrown to her head. Um, she still spoke again the following day, but, that's what happened with their van. They weren't as welcome. Um, in fact, people were hostile. And then in 1913, this lady at the bottom here, Nina Boyle, she came back, but she parked herself on the coastline. She went to Herne Bay. And they basically decided that they needed to target not only the residents, but the tourists. So what better place to go than the coastline? So that's why they went there. But she was there a lot longer than first planned. So. Just fascinating people. Yeah. I'll just quickly finish with this, only because, you know, I said to you, could Kathleen be in that picture? Mm. It is possible to find people, and unfortunately I found this lady after I published my book. So here, this lady here, sort of leaning, <coughs> is the lady in the chair. I didn't know that. 
So she's called Rosa Bay Billinghurst. And um, this was a proper WSPU, um, so the Pankhurst led group that came to Kent. They only went to West Kent, they went to the Seven Oaks Houston area only, and they weren't there long. I think they were playing a little bit. They were called the Gypsy Queens, and they had their dogs and their horse, and they did a lot of singing and dancing as well as speaking. But Rosa May was with them, she's definitely that lady there. And I didn't know it. She was actually on the run at the time. She was a mouse. So she'd been let out of prison and she was recuperating. She was out, out campaigning. Um, and she was on the, on the run, basically, from the authorities. But she was an awesome lady, written lots of books herself about her experiences. She was arrested, forcibly fed numerous times. She never, ever, ever let them get her out of the chair when she was arrested, ever. She always, always made him pick the chair up and carry it around the chair. <laughs> Very determined lady. But this is what I go back to with the thing with Kathleen and um, all these other projects that could come out and findings. You never know. You know, you study pictures and you just never know. Anyway, I'll be quiet now because I could go on forever. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jenny, Sam and Sarah, it's been so interesting. I could listen all night. <laughs> it's been absolutely fantastic to hear. And uh, also a wonderful celebration of International Women's Day as well. Yes. Just absolutely brilliant. So thank you, everybody, and thank you for coming. We hope you've enjoyed your evening, and we wish you all a safe journey home as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.